everybody. I'm Charlotte from the Teen Yoga Foundation. One of the topics that we love to cover in um, our Teen Yoga course, which runs four or five times a year online and twice face to face in London, is the neuroscience of yoga. So what actually happens to the brain during yoga? So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a pricey here of a very in-depth topic we spend a good two weeks covering on the online course. So many of us who practice yoga, probably all of us who are actually watching this video, um, have noticed benefits, which is why we carry on doing it, right? We feel better, we feel more relaxed, we feel more alert, we sleep better. Um, some people feel that they get better friendships, they have better relationships, both with themselves, with other people, strangers, friends, you know, friends, partners. Um, some people feel that they're able to absorb information better after doing a yoga class. And definitely most people feel that their anxiety subsides, which is why they keep coming back. So I went on a bit of a hunt as to what, why this happens, what actually goes on in the brain, particularly of a young person. And I thought I might just break that down for you a little bit. When we practice yoga, what do we mean by yoga, first of all? So what, what I mean by yoga is um, asana, which is deliberate, conscious, mindful movement. Pranayama, which is um, controlling the prana or breathing techniques, controlling the breath. And Shavasana, relaxation, or even Yoga Nidra, which is a full relaxation of the body and the mind and the nervous system. So these are what I take to mean when I speak of yoga. The other element which exists in face to face classes and sometimes online it's able, we're able to reconstruct that is this experience of Sangha, an experience of belonging to a community, an optimistic and positive community. So how does this change the brain? What impact does this have on our brain? Well, maybe you've already started to work out by the words I've been using that there's one common element to all these different aspects and that is conscious that we're doing something consciously which previously has been automatic most of our movements are automatic me moving my hand like this i'm not planning it it just happens to help me make a point my breathing mostly is automatic. Um, and even my relaxation can be automatic in as much as when I fall asleep, I automatically relax if I'm lucky. Whereas in yoga, what we're doing is we're making the unconscious conscious. Unconscious movement, unconscious activity happens in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is at the base of the, uh, of the um, of the brain at the top of the spine and conscious activity, conscious responding, conscious activity activates what's called the prefrontal cortex, which is this area of the brain here. When we look at scans of people who are very reactive, that could be aggressive, usually, or uh, unable to control their emotions, unable to self regulate, often there's very little activity in the prefrontal cortex. We've noticed, however, that with meditators, the prefrontal cortex seems to become very active initially. So we draw the conclusion that when we perform asana, we are activating the prefrontal cortex. We're activating the area of our mind, of our brain, 
that is responsible for responding. So the prefrontal cortex, Dan Siegel, Professor Dan Siegel does a great um, explanation of this, which is his hand model, right? So let's just go to that for a second. Prefrontal cortex is this area of the brain. This is the brain stem here. Uh, this is the brain. This is your, your eyes are here, the back of your head is here. And when we flip our lid, when we don't can't control our emotions, we expose what's called the amygdala, the amygdala and the hippocampus. The amygdala is our fight or flight um, center of the brain. When we wrap it in our prefrontal cortex, we're able to soothe ourselves. So Dan Siegel speaks of uh, fantastic examples of how we can heal ourselves from trauma. Peter Levine also speaks of this through activating the prefrontal cortex and soothing ourselves, soothing that reactive amygdala response. So what we're doing in asana is we're making something that's automatic, movement, walking, running, cooking, washing up, making the beds. We're making movement conscious. We're using the prefrontal cortex, activating the prefrontal cortex, and therefore stimulating that area of the brain that allows us to be more responsive rather than reactive. Moving on to pranayama now, with the pranayama practice, what we're doing in most pranayama practices, we're extending the exhalation consciously. Whenever we extend the exhalation, we are engaging the parasympathetic nervous system, which means we are moving away from the amygdala response and we're moving into a response which allows the body to relax. So we are consciously affecting the autonomic nervous system consciously telling our autonomic nervous system to relax itself, to switch from sympathetic to parasympathetic. This is a superpower that most people don't um, have access to. So what that's doing again is creating neural pathways in the brain, which is stopping that amygdala response, that amygdala reaction to an event. And then the act of relaxation at the end of the class, the yoga nidra or the shavasana, is also through a body scan, for example, introducing the brain to active relaxation, responding actively in a relaxed manner whenever and wherever you need to. So become, the, the relaxed response becomes the default response. And Dan Siegel, again, going back to Dan Siegel, he speaks a lot about the release of trauma from this because we have a reaction. So maybe um, I'm afraid of dogs. I don't know why this isn't the case. I'm just giving an example. A dog comes towards me. I freeze. If I'm doing meditation, if I'm doing relaxation, it has many, many examples of this that memory that implicit memory of the dog bite that i had when i was two or three can surface up into our memory into our explicit memory this is how he explains it during a moment of deep relaxation when we have created safety for ourselves in our minds the reason for our trauma is released and understood so that the next time I see a dog, I can have that reactive response and then I can remember. So I have that reaction and I say, actually, that belongs in the past. That was an experience that I had in the past. I can stop myself, take a breath and witness my own reaction, step out, witness my own reaction and say, ah, I'm reacting like this because once upon a time I was bitten by a dog. And now I don't need to be afraid of this dog because this is a different dog. 
and the owners told me he's safe or whatever. So in this way, I'm actually even changing my character. The things that used to trigger me, the things that used to make me um, recoil in fear, I can now approach in safety. So I'm creating a safe space for myself in my own head through conscious movement, conscious breathing, relaxation, and finally, Sangha, a safe space where I know that I'll be accepted, loved and cared for by a healthy group of individuals who help me to co-regulate myself. So there's a self-regulation and a co-regulation by creating safety in the brain. So we're creating a stronger prefrontal cortex initially which allows us to calm our amygdala down, our fear reaction down. And then finally that feeds back into our, um, our cerebellum at the back of the head, which is our automatic responses. So in this way, yoga very cleverly helps us to shift our trajectory in life, creating positive, um, proactive approaching mechanisms as opposed to self-protective and recoiling mechanisms, which are the result of trauma and fear. If you'd like to know specifically how this um, helps teenagers and young people do come on one of our courses. We run online courses and face-to-face -face courses throughout the year. So all you need to do is go to our website, www.teenyoga.com to find out more. Thank you so much for your time. Take care.